from EWTN News Nightly in Washington, D.C., I'm Tracy Sable with an EWTN News Link. At least 13 people, including a child, are injured after Russia fired 31 ballistic and cruise missiles at Kyiv. Air defenses were able to shoot down all of the incoming missiles. This was the first attack on the Ukrainian capital in six weeks. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas is getting closer. Speaking with Saudi Arabia state media on his latest Middle East trip, Blinken said a strong proposal was put forward. He'll travel to Israel later this week. Actor Jonathan Rumi will be the commencement speaker at the Catholic University of America this year. The CUA president says that Rumi's work is a great example of Catholics using their God-given talents to bring people closer to God. I'm Tracy Sabe with EWTN News Nightly. Follow us on Facebook and X and be sure to join us this evening. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Brian Mullady. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. We're ready to take your phone calls. Pick up the phone and give us a jingle at 833-288-EWTN. That is a free telephone call anywhere in North America with any of your questions about the Catholic faith. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. That number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. 2985. And you can always send us an email. That email address is openline at ewtn.com. I'm Jack Williams, Charles Beery, once again producing the program today. Your call screener is Matt Gubensky and Ace McKay handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our hostess, he is every Thursday, Dominican Father Brian Milady. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Terrific, thanks. This past Tuesday, we celebrated the solemnity of St. Joseph, and you wanted to talk a little bit about this great saint at the top of the show today. Oh, gosh, yes. There's so much to say about St. Joseph. And when you consider that he said nothing, <laughs> it's <laughs> very interesting. Um, first of all, of course, he's the patron of the Universal Church. And it was under that title that John XXIII re-added him to the canon, uh, or added him to the canon in the 60s or 70s. And then they added him to the others uh, after that. Uh, St. Joseph is very interesting because he is a father, but he's a virginal father. So therefore, he's patron saint of marriage and virginity. He's also a very active person because, you know, he lives and does work. That's why on the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, what we're doing is celebrating all the working people in the world. But he's also the patron saint of contemplatives. I remember I had one priest friend. He described St. Joseph in a homily he gave as someone who is very uh, contemplative, but also active. And his place is like the silent witness of the sanctuary lamp and the sanctuary to the presence of Jesus. He's also the protectress of Mary. Uh, you can go down the list. And I think we need to clarify one thing right off the, the start. St. Joseph never questioned Mary's virginity. In other words, it wasn't um, a case of him finding out she was the child before they were ma married, and therefore she's an unwed mother. 
and him wanting in anger to send her away, but it never happened. No, that's not what it is. What it is is this, and this is often the fathers of the church and their attitude, that um, Moses, when he came near the burning bush, you remember he thought that it was such a holy experience that he didn't know what his place was in the whole thing. So his idea was, who am I that I should be chosen to be a part of this mystery? In a similar way, Joseph's attitude is very much like the um, St. Peter when he's forgiven his sins. And he says, who am I that my Lord should come to me? And also, who am I is another instance and another episode that the mother of my Lord should come to me. That's Elizabeth when Mary visits her, when the visitation occurs. And Joseph has an essential role in the history of salvation. And it's not to tell us that Mary's a virgin or the virgin birth is miraculous. It's to tell us what our place is in the whole thing. So, as you know, in the famous annunciations, there are several, there's not just Mary's, but Joseph also has an annunciation and Zechariah has an annunciation. Joseph is told, first of all, do not be afraid that, that Mary has conceived this child. And then the angel tells him, it's by the Holy Spirit that he's conceived this child. And so he's invited to become the spouse of the Virgin, but not with the prospect of marrying. Now, the question has always been, how could Mary and Joseph be said to have a proper marriage? And we do believe they had a proper marriage <clears throat> if they never can consummate it, if they have a promise never to consummate it. Well, it's a logical problem. Eight three three two eight. Oh, go ahead, Father. Mary and Joseph had a true and authentic marriage, but the condition was they were not to consummate it as God told them unless he told them to. And so they submitted everything in their ordinary life to, including this, this very important decision, to the word of the Father and also to the um, enunciation of the angel. And as a result, they fulfilled the condition of marriage which is that you can't exclude uh, sexuality totally by choice and have an authentic marriage because they were open to it if God should will, they should have it. And yet theirs was a unique marriage because the virginal spouses were related to each other. Eight three three two eight eight E W T N. That's our toll free number. It is a free telephone call anywhere in North America. Eight three three two eight eight three nine eight six. We have an email from Frank, and he says, "How father do I respond to someone who says that there were two sacrifices: Jesus at the Last Supper and Jesus dying on the cross?" Oh yeah. Well. You can say that in a sense, there are two sacrifices. In a sense, not really. They're actually one. Because one is bloody and the other isn't bloody. We don't continuously kill Christ on the altar. and We never believe that, even though some people attribute that to us. But it is actually one and the same sacrifice that was eternally offered on the cross and whose fruits we are eternally invited to participate in. 
So it's not two sacrifices as such. It's one only, and that is the sacrifice of Christ. And uh, we are invited to enter deeply into the mystery, even in our own time. Uh, Joy wonders, when the final judgment happens, will people experience purgatory any longer? Uh, no. Uh, the conditions that endure after the final judgment are heaven, hell, and the limbo of the just. I'm um, sorry, of the children. Because the, 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 of course the limbo of the children is a debated point. But no, there's no purgatory anymore. And there's no, uh, and there's heaven, but there is heaven and hell. And when purgatory is finally realized, uh, after the atonement is satisfied, it ceases to exist to other people who were on earth. There won't be any, or because there's no more people to come on to earth. We've pretty much exhausted the people <laughs> and uh, what they did when they were on earth. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Wide open phone lines for you at 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. That number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. This is Father Joseph Mary. This week on the Catholic Sphere, my panelists include Bishop Daniel E. Thomas, Timothy Glemkowski, and Chanel Shaw discussing the National Eucharistic Congress and how the National Eucharistic Revival can strengthen your faith this July. The Catholic Sphere, Sunday afternoon, 2.30 Eastern on EWTN Radio. One of Mother Angelica's favorite devotions was the Stations of the Cross. Rita Rizzo would pray it regularly at St. Anthony Catholic Church in Canton, Ohio, and she continued to do so throughout her life. In honor of Mother and her legacy, EWTN Publishing brings you this special edition of Mother Angelica's The Way of the Cross, featuring images of the actual stations that Mother herself meditated on in her youth, with meditations taken from the scriptures, which were Mother's constant source of inspiration. Now you too can add this very personal approach of Mother's to your own private devotional prayer life. Mother Angelica's The Way of the Cross, edited by Father Joseph Mary Wolf from EWTN Publishing, now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1 800 854 6316. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, our bishops here in the United States have called for a uh, three year Eucharistic revival, and you can journey deeper into your understanding of the Eucharistic mystery and understand the Eucharistic story of God's love for us from the Old Testament to the institution of the Eucharist, simply download the free e-book, The Twelve Stations of the Most Holy Eucharist, at EWTN.com slash Catholicism. 833-288-EWTN, that's our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. First up today is Stephanie, a first-time caller in the great state of North Carolina, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Stephanie, you are on with Father Brian Mullady. Hi, Father. Thank you for taking my call. I wanted to find out, um, 
I am a convert, and so I'm, I've come back to the church as a convert, and so there's a lot of information that I'm trying to understand, but also people are asking me questions because I was a Protestant for, for several years, and they're like, why would you do that? So when people ask me things, I, I want to be able to tell them. So my question to you is, I love the information that you were just talking about with Mary and Joseph and how their marriage wasn't consummated, and that they would that they would have consummated it if God would have told them to. But how do we know that information? Or where do we, you know, where do we get that kind of information so that at least I can know how to better answer when people ask questions like that? Well, how do we know Mary was a virgin and weren't they married and you know all of the things that Protestants say? All right. Well, some of this comes from tradition. You know, I mean, the church has always thought about Mary as a virgin until the Protestant Reformation, where for some reason she was unvirgined. I don't know why. I think sometimes people think that they wanted to emphasize marriage. And so they think that to say that someone is a virgin uh, somehow de denigrates marriage. I remember I gave a talk on this very subject at... Um, an Episcopal church in Texas. And I was trying to emphasize uh, that you can be a virgin and also be married because the primary state of virginity, now this is only for Mary and Joseph, obviously, it's for a very specialized group, that um, this is only because of Mary's place in the history of salvation. Um, so this, I asked if there were any questions. And this man raised his hand and he said, so you think marriage is evil, huh? I said, what? Did I say, did anyone hear me say that? Who heard me say that? Anyone? No, I don't think marriage is evil, but I think there is a higher state also to which we're all, which we're called in heaven. Everybody's going to be virginal in heaven. No, no spouses in heaven, you know. That's why we say till death do us part. And uh, we'll have the same, we'll have our love for our spouse. We won't lose that. But the marital relationship as such as a kind of legalized relationship is proper to heaven, uh, is a proper to earth, not to heaven. And so uh, I found that, of course, I'm a Catholic from my childhood. I found it very hard to understand people's mentality toward that because I never experienced that. You know, I, I grew up in a church where in the 50s we used to use cardboard boxes in May and make May altars <laughs> to the Virgin Mary. And the nuns would get us these little plastic statues that didn't cost hardly anything. And you put flower, a flower, or a candle, or something on these little plastic statues. So celebrating virginity was never something we thought was bad. On the other hand, some people shouldn't be virgins because they're not called to it. I mean, most of the human race shouldn't be virgin because they're not called to it. But for those who are, God gives us a grace or an ability or a gift to enable us to live in this grace. And many of the things that maybe are not expressly written in sacred scripture are things, as you talk about the tradition of the church, are things that have been taught always and everywhere within the church from the very time Jesus walked the earth. Is that right? Yeah, and also, uh, you know, people have had 2,000 years to think about all these things. And when they try to define what it is they were thinking about or what it is we believe, they come up with very interesting explanations, some of which are outlandish, some of which are beautiful. And so the church has to make a choice as far as to what to accept and what to deny. I've just been reading the history of the city of Alexandria, which was very much taken over in the Aryan controversy. And oh my goodness, all this the stuff they went through over it um, for the Council of Nicaea. 
So, uh, yeah, it's, it's us who reflect on this. After all, we do have minds. God didn't take away our brain. And what's clearly in Scripture, literally in the Scripture, you know, that we can affirm. But a lot of things are literally in the Scripture. They may be suggested in Scripture. They may be uh, uh, something that God expects us to figure out. Or, as I say, he may want to do the revealing directly himself. Thanks, Stephanie. We appreciate the phone call today. Wide open lines for you today at 833-288-EWTN. Pick up the phone and give us a call. Matt Kubensky is nodding off in the call screening room as we speak. 833-288-3986. No, uh, Will writes in, is the Roman Catholic understanding of reality based on God's word and revelation? For example, atheists might have a theory of knowledge based on empiricism, while Christians seem to believe in creation based on the Bible, God's word. Well, uh, I would say that there is a perennial philosophy which Christian revelation presumes. And it wasn't until that perennial philosophy was worked out partially that we actually could experience an objective revelation. So it's not exactly true to say, well, the Bible has its way of looking at things and philosophy has its way of looking at things and they can be contradictory to each other. That's a typical thing of the faith and reason being conflict. Catholicism is not believed in that and St. Thomas Aquinas is very clear about that. There can be no conflict between faith and reason. And uh, Paul John Paul II was very solicitous to make that point clear. Again, we as Catholics do not check our brains at the door when we come in. And so that's why we're so interested in philosophy. 833-288-EWTN, that's our toll-free number. It is a free telephone call for you anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. Uh, John asks, does the church teach that people are innately good but commit evil acts, or that people are evil when they've committed evil acts? Well, I think it's the wrong way to ask the question. Uh, first of all, there is no such thing as someone who's innately good or innately evil, as far as morals is concerned. They have to form themselves according to what their soul's potentials are. And because we have free will, we can form ourselves in many different ways, almost an infinite number of ways. So we have to practice what's right in order to... Um, cause integrity so that we live according to what we're supposed to be. In that sense, you could say we're innately right. All the um, powers of our soul that we have do belong together in a certain way, and if they're not together in that way, it's, it's over. And it's all, all those powers are what goes to form our freedom, too. But there are powers, for example, we have an innate power to receive grace. If we're not open to that by our actions, it doesn't matter how much we say we can conform ourselves, we won't be able to do that. Then you can't say we're innately evil either. We do have a tendency to evil by uh, truth. Uh, freedom, but we do not have uh, a tendency that is always um, efficacious, in other words, that we always make use of. So we have to do the proper choice using, and we have to do the proper intending in order to get this thing that is our interior life together in uh, an integral whole. And kind of a related question, Mary wants to know, how is faith a rational thing? 
Oh, <laughs> because it's about truth. <laughs> if it's about truth, it has to be about reason. Um, yeah, faith is, since the 19th century, when the philosopher Immanuel Kant in Germany succeeded in divorcing truth from faith, I mean, faith is sentiment, you know, how you feel about things, basically. Uh, faith has become irrational and pious, but not with any, you know, hookup to reality as such. But we don't believe that. We believe that faith is reasonable and not only reasonable, but that the more we enter into the faith, the more we enter into the uh, order of the universe and therefore the proper way in which things are experienced. 833-288-EWTN. That is our toll-free number. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Patty in Florida, Margaret in Oklahoma, and we've got plenty of time for your phone calls as well. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. And you can always send us an email. That email address again is openline at EWTN.com. That's openline, all one word, at EWTN.com. It's EWTN's Open Line Thursday with Dominican Father Brian Milady. Passionist Father Cedric Pesenia and Father Richard Ho Lung and the Missionaries of the Poor take you on an hour-long Lenten pilgrimage as we journey towards Easter. Sunday night, 5 Eastern on EWTN Radio. Hello, I'm Bishop David O'Connell, the Bishop of the Diocese of Trenton, and this is a Eucharistic moment. Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, renowned 20th century American philosopher, writer and preacher reflected. When I stand up to talk, people listen to me. They will follow what I have to say. Is it any power of mine? Of course not. St. Paul says, what have you that you have not received? And you who have received, why do you glory as if you had not? But the secret of my power is that I have never in 55 years missed spending an hour in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. That's where the power comes from. That's where sermons are born. That's where every good thought is conceived. Proclaiming the faith, changing lives. The year was 1981. The FCC licensed to operate a satellite earth station, the first ever given to an order of nuns, was granted to Our Lady of the Angels Monastery. Mother Angelica flips the switch and EWTN begins transmitting from Irondale, Alabama. To learn more about Mother Angelica's life and the history of EWTN, visit EWTN.com slash Mother Angelica. Is the Bible the sole rule of faith? Are we saved by faith alone? Hear the answers on Called to Communion tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. Now back to Open Line with Father Brian Mullady. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Join us for Fire on Earth Monday through Friday mornings at 5.15 a.m. Eastern Time. On tomorrow's show, Peter Herbeck continues to reflect on John chapter 8 and discusses what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus and how Christianity is an invitation to follow Jesus and learn his way of life. That's Fire on Earth with Peter Herbeck, Monday through Friday mornings, 5.15 a.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio. Back to the phones we go. Patty is in the great state of Florida listening on Divine Mercy Radio. Patty, thank you for holding. Welcome to the program. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Yeah. Okay. 
right, um, I was married years ago, and I was only married for a year, and I got divorced, but I have been remarried. Not in the church, I've remarried, but I've been remarried for 28 years. Is it still not right to, you know, am I still not allowed to receive communion? Well, look, we look upon you as still married. If you were married in the church the first time, were you married in the church the first time? Yes. All right, and you never got a separation or an annulment. I got divorced, but not from the. I didn't get an annulment from the church. I got a, a legal that's divorce. What, uh, that's what I wanted to know. Okay, well, uh, you know you can't receive communion because we look on that as receiving communion in the state of sin, mortal sin, which you can't do. I know there's been a lot of debate about this recently, but I was reading the debate over whether Catholics could go to communion who had been recently divorced. And some of the fa church officials who were more in favor of changing this said, oh, yeah, well, of course, they don't even see each other anymore. There's nothing uh, they have in common. They're taking care of the kids, et cetera, and they go on and on and on. I said, well, all that may be true, but the point is they're considering themselves married to the second person, and they have no, it's like being married, uh, you know, to, uh, illicitly to someone. Uh, so no, you can't. I'm sorry. You have to fix up your first marriage to do it. That's right. That's the bad news. The good news is that there is a potential to get that rectified, Patty. And I would suggest mm -hmm. that you contact the pastor of your local parish and uh, mm -hmm. set up a meeting with him, explain your situation, and he can take the steps necessary to try to uh, normalize your current situation. And then there is the possibility, no guarantees, because I don't know all the ins and outs of your situation, but there is the po possibility that perhaps somewhere down the road you would be able to receive. you agree with that, Father? Uh, yes, but it has to, her first marriage has to right. be annulled, and then she has to be married in the church. Right, right. So there is a path forward potentially, Patty. I would get to meet with that uh, pastor in your local parish, and yeah. we appreciate your phone call today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next up is Margaret. She is in the great state of Oklahoma listening on Ave Maria Radio online. Margaret, you are on with Father Milady. Good afternoon. Hi. My question is about double dissecting, which when you go down on both knees instead of just one. Um, oh, yes. when, is, when is appropriate to do that? Um, uh, when the sacrament is exposed in the in the monstrance, when it's not in the tabernacle, and it's not, um, you know, it's outside, maybe in the monstrance or so that you can see it, uh, that's when it's appropriate. Does that make sense, Margaret? Yes, it does. One more quick question. Yes. So, like on on good on the during the Good Friday service when they remove the the um, when there's no in the tabernacle, we just sit, like, we don't genuflect or anything. About oh, the people in the church and the tabernacle's empty. Yeah, I believe that's what she's asking. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. You don't have to. Some people bow. Some people just sit or. Things like that. Uh, and there's nothing wrong shit. with bowing to the altar, right? Oh, the crucifix, yeah. for that matter. Yeah. yeah. Well, the crucifix is an important symbol of Christ's passion. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. God bless you, Margaret. Thanks for the call. We hope you finish out Lent strong and have a great Easter season. That frees up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 288 3986. Uh, Father Joseph is calling us, a first time caller in Livonia, Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Father, welcome to the program. You're on with Father Brian Milady. Thank you. Glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I just wanted to make an observation, and I am sure you concur with this, about the 
perpetual virginity of Mary being affirmed from the earliest days of the Church. In the Eastern tradition, we make it very emphatic because in all icons of Mary, she's unique among all the saints, that she has three stars in, within the nimbus, the halo, because she's a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, exalting the dignity of marriage, which is a sacrament, but the union between a husband and a wife, we do have uh, icons that was called the conception of Anna, which really is the conception of Mary within her womb, Anna's womb. But the mm -hmm. icon shows uh, the couple, both uh, Joachim and Anna, embracing each other gently, and their cheeks uh, meet each other. In the background, there's the marriage bed. That's it. But we all know that uh, Mary uh, took on uh, a human mother and father, distinct from, mm -hmm. of course, the way she conceived uh, her divine son in her womb. So just to make those two comments. Yes, and what's also clear from the iconic representations is that you'll never find an icon of Mary and Joseph embracing each other. And the reason is because they didn't consummate their marriage. Whereas Joachim and Anna, yes, that's the famous interpretation where the iconographer showed that they had actually uh, consummated their marriage, Anna and Joachim. So we very much needed to underscore the difference between Mary's conception and Christ's conception, which is unique. Yeah, a lot of beautiful icons have been written about many of the teachings of the church over the years, and it would really behoove us to take a look at those once in a while, huh? Absolutely. They're, some of them are very beautiful and very symbolic. God bless you, Father Joseph. Thank you so much for the phone call today. That opens up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. Dave is in McPherson, Kansas, listening on Divine Mercy Radio. Dave, you're on with Father Brian Milady. Well, great. Thank you, gentlemen. I have to warn you, there, there's no fear in this person. That's what we commonly say. Uh, I have a question regarding, um, well, would Adam and Eve have not suffered death had the fall not occurred? So that's yes. the first question. And as a corollary to that, what is the implication of that answer with regard to the tradition, capital T tradition, of uh, our Blessed Mother's Dormition? All right. Well, you have to distinguish the difference between a corrupting death and a death which is just like falling asleep, like in Snow White, you know, she falls into the sleep of the living death and she still has the rosy cheeks and the whole thing. Uh, in the case of Adam and Eve's death, they would have been, uh, had they not sinned, they would have been like a falling asleep, death would have been like a falling asleep for them. And they would not have experienced a corrupting death. The corruption of death is what's caused by sin. And also, and the pain of it, too. Now, with us, of course, we have both. So, and many people fear death because of that. 833-288-EWTN, that's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next stop for us is the great state of Illinois. Jeff is uh, listening or watching on Roku today. Jeff, you're on with Father Brian Milady. Hey, thank you very much, Jack, and Father, for taking my call. I really appreciate it. I was wondering if, uh, I'm asking if Father uh, Brian could uh, make some recommendations about how to think about different passages in the Old Testament that suggest God experiences emotions uh, that are really more what I would associate with the human experience than the divine. Uh, references to God having. Oh yeah, you mean like he'll he'll rise and smite them, and uh, the uh, just will be blood bathe their feet in the blood of the wicked, and all this business. Um, they're all metaphors 
or to describe interior acts, uh, which we would feel if we did them in relationship to God. But as someone was pointing out here on the show before this one, uh, they're not um, real for God. God is only love. But they're experienced by us as that because in experiencing that, we can understand what our um, uh, relationship is with God, not what his is with us. So uh, it's important to recognize just where we experience a kind of animosity toward God and what causes it in us. Thanks, Jeff. We appreciate the call today. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. It's a free telephone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. Sue is in Columbus, Nebraska, listening on Spirit Catholic Radio. Sue, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Brian, Brian Milady. Hi, Father. Thank you so much for taking my call. I was wondering, you know, Jesus was a Jew, and and he was the chosen, the, the Jews were the chosen people. How did we get to be the chosen people as Catholics? Oh, well, the whole idea of the chosen people is the people in the state of grace that is oriented toward the one from whom the Messiah will come. Now, in us, in the Christian church, we inherited the chosen people from the Jews. Because, uh, for example, we, the, one of the great controversies at the beginning of the church concerned circumcision, whether we had to be circumcised or not. And St. Paul was very clear that we didn't have to be. So it's the idea of faith that's the important thing. In the readings, we've been reading about Abraham's faith in the Mass recently. So it's Abraham's faith. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You are not 50 years old. How can you say you have seen Abraham? Jesus said, before Abraham came to be, I am. And, of course, that's when they want to stone him because they think he is uh, practicing blasphemy. We uh, approach this from the point of view of faith or eternity. And the chosen people will always, in a sense, be the chosen people. But now uh, they've been superseded once Christ died on the cross by new sacraments, a new way of looking at things, and emphasizing the interior nature of faith. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Still time for your phone calls at 833-288-3986. Stephen is in the great state of Connecticut, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Stephen, you're on with Father Brian Milady. Hello, Father. Um, I wanted to ask you why Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, and I always wanted to hear him say the Son of God. Well, actually, he's both, isn't he? Uh, because he represents humanity in the uh, perfect obedience on the cross, and therefore atones for the sin because of that. Uh Son of Man is a very peculiar expression. It's be used a lot in the New Testament by Christ regarding himself. And it has a great deal to do with, well, I think, was it today? What is it in the reading? You know, one, they recently concerning Susanna, uh, concerning uh, um, our Lord himself with regard to the people of the, or Daniel with regard to the people of the uh, diaspora, you know, the community in Babylon. So it's a unique term given to Christ, but it's a term which goes beyond the normal terms given to uh, figures 
that are connected with the redemption. Thanks, Stephen. We appreciate the call today. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. James is a first-time caller in East Tennessee listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. James, you are on with Father Brian Mullady. First of all, Viva Jesus. Viva Jesus. And uh, my, question, my question is I was baptized twice. Once when I was in an orphanage, uh, from six months to three years old, but then I was baptized again uh, once I was adopted. Is that well, possible? you can't be baptized twice. So if the first one's valid, the second one doesn't count for anything, really. Yeah, because if I, I was. I guess baptized, you know, with an adopted name. I didn't get the second part. Baptized. He was baptized with his adopted name. My guess is, James, probably after you were adopted, there may have been some question as to the validity of uh, your baptism at the orphanage, and maybe it was a conditional baptism. Yes. But, but he was. You were. You were definitely only baptized once. Uh, if the first one was invalid, then the second one would cover it. And if the first one was valid, then the second one was just a bath. Does that make sense? That's, yeah. A bath. But okay. Bath. Yeah. <laughs> and as I say to everyone, be about Jesus. Thank you, James. We appreciate that. Yeah. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. We can still squeeze in a couple more phone calls at 833-288-3986. Milsa is a first-time caller in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Milsa, you're on with Father Milady. Hi, Father Milady. I called call last week, but I never got an answer. I left a message. I just wanted to know, is there any reason why in the Novus Ordus Mass you can wear a head covering? I didn't get it. She's wondering if you can wear a chapel veil to a Novus Ordo Mass. Sure. Why not? Yeah. If you'll if you'll watch Mass on EWTN, the Novus Ordo Mass, you'll see a lot of people right. that come into our chapel that have veils. Yeah, you're not required to, but in the old right, you were required to. And that's why you had the women that had to get the Kleenex even to go into church. You know, they take a piece of Kleenex and put a bobby pin in it so they'd have their head covered. I think it was got to a little bit of a ridiculous point, but... Uh, myself but then i don't ever tell women how to dress <laughs> so, i think that's a good practice in general <laughs> good practice. Yeah. Yeah. god bless you milsa thanks so much for uh keeping yeah. for being persistent and getting in to get your question answered here on open line thursday quickly we can still get your call in if you give a pick up the phone right now and give us a call at 833-288-EWTN that's 833-288 Three nine eight six. Thomas would like to know, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, did he even have the option of committing a sin and giving in to temptation since he's God? Well, the issue isn't his divinity. The issue is his humanity, because it's only on that level that he can be tempted. So our Lord... Uh, couldn't be tempted only because his humanity, his sacred humanity, was so integral that if there was a temptation, and there certainly was, I mean, you can imagine fasting for 40 days as a man, uh, and you'd be hungry. It's true. <laughs> but uh, it's only an exterior temptation, a temptation by word, if you want to put it that way. They can't enter into the center of your soul because... Uh, Jesus does not have concupiscence. He doesn't have moral weakness. Again, we've still got a couple of minutes here. If you want to give us a call at 833-288-EWTN, that's 833-288-3986. 
Um, we have another uh, another email from an Eastern Rite father. You're number one in the Eastern Rite today, Father. Uh, father yes, Sophie, so. yeah, Father Sophie writes in. I do not understand how the Catholic Church can include on the liturgical calendar for the Roman Rite a feast of Coptic Orthodox martyrs. While I recognize that these men truly died for their faith in Jesus, they were not in full communion with the church Jesus founded. Thank you for whatever light you can shed on this. I can't shed any light on any disputes between the uh, various rites of the uh, Eastern Church. This is go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And frankly, I don't really, even the famous uh, 1054 schism. I really fail to see what causes it today. So I can't really do that. I think we need to just get on with life. And uh, someone needs to agree or disagree. I just think that we're going to move on this way. Jeff wants to know if you can help him prove that faith and science are very compatible. Oh, gee. <laughs> you want that in one minute? <laughs> Yeah, we got uh, uh, about four minutes. <laughs> uh, four minutes, yeah. Well, look, the same God created nature and revealed salvation to us. It's not possible for that God to tell us that nature means one thing and salvation means another. Because they both come from the same mind. And not only that, but uh, God loves us and, and wants us to know the truth on all these levels. Again, that's why he gave us a brain to think with. So that's the only way I can give you in this short period of time uh, a manner of explanation. I'd have to have a specific question. I can't just off the top of my head think of something. Grant wants to know if there's a quick rational argument for the intrinsic human value. Oh, yeah, it's our moral soul, of course. Uh, it's the fact that we have a spirit. The fact that our spirit demands that it be directly created by God because it is a spirit. And the fact that, therefore, uh, no person may be an object of use. Every person must be a subject of love. And I think anybody who's being honest with themselves, Father, you really wouldn't have to look around a whole lot, would you, to realize that there's really nothing else like us here? True. And I also think that it's very strange that people want to say, for example, abortion's evil, human life is always valuable, you go on and on, but they seem to think that they need to find arguments and rationality to prove that, if if it's true that we have an immortal soul, we don't, that's all the arguments we need. 833-288-EWTN, that's our toll-free number, uh, 833-288-3986. Now, if you'll call that uh, line after 5 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday... Uh, or any time on Saturday and Sunday, you can actually leave a question on our listener comment line call for your favorite open line host. If you want a question for Father Milady, just simply say it's a question for Father Milady. But just call our regular lines at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. And again, if you will do that after 5 p.m. Eastern, excuse me, after 5 p.m. Central Time, uh, Monday through Friday, or any time during the weekend, then we will get that message to the appropriate host. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Brian Milady, our celebrity producer, Mr. Charles Beery, our call screener, Matt Gubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Ace McKay. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Thursday. Back at it tomorrow with Open Line Friday. We'll have our very own Vice President of Theology in the house, Mr. Colin Donovan. Until we get together tomorrow with Colin, God bless.
The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. Human beings are God's greatest message.